to see your smiling faces. Hey, anybody watching the Olympics? What about the uh, what about the, the the men's gymnastics? What what about the kid with the with the glasses, Clark Kent? From Massachusetts. For those of you that haven't been watching it, what a, an awesome, inspiring thing that the men's gymnastics has done. You say, well, why are we talking about that? Because it, 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 it's fun to talk about. Are, are we okay with that? No, seriously, I, you know, I love, I, was, I stayed up late last night watching the gymnastics and, you know, he was going for, I guess, uh, for a, uh, not the team, they already did the team one where they won the bronze. We haven't won in, what, 16 years, I think, since, since the men, the U.S. Uh, men's gymnastics has won, a, won a, uh, a medal. But he was doing an individual last night. But he's, if, if for those of you that haven't seen it, young guy from Massachusetts, and he has two eye conditions. He's got cross-eyed, and he's got another eye condition. And so before he goes up, he takes off his glasses, and he's going like this. And, and it looks like he's, he, he literally is doing his routine blind, basically blind. And it makes the whole thing all the more impactful. And I say that because I also know that this month, I, I saw this at Starbucks yesterday, they have a sign that says that it is Disability Pride Month. And, um, and, and you know, I thought, well, that kind of... Sounds strange, why were we celebrating disabilities? And then I kind of had to look it up. And I, and I was having a little fun with that and looking it up. And I kind of thought about this young man. How many of us allow disabilities to take us out of the running? To keep us from, from living impactful lives? Because we feel like, well, we've got a disadvantage. So I'm getting ready for church this morning and Literally finishing up doing this, loving what I'm seeing, and then I notice that I got a rip in the side of my Aloha shirt. And I thought of, this is a disability, and you're going to be looking at this all day when I'm preaching. And I thought, I better go change my shirt. But then I thought, you know what? I am going to wear it because this is a symbol that all of our lives are distressed in some way, shape, or form. Some of you pay money for distressed clothes. I just distress them on my own for free. Come on, just have some fun with me today. Amen. So the, the focus of the thing is it still covers all the necessary parts. It's just a little distressed. Uh, today we're going to continue in our summer mixtape series, and we're going to be talking about spiritual maturity. Yeah. I thought, Lord, why did you give me this? Because you know I don't want to grow up. And he said, that's not what I'm talking about. So let's pray first and find out what it is he's talking about. Father, thank you for your word that is alive. Thank you for showing us, Father God, just the secrets that are in your word, revealing those to us and, and, and blending those into our daily life, our routines, uh, our growth path with you. And we give you thanks for your presence here today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go. This is... This is chapter five. This is, this is week number five of this mixtape series. We know that it's, uh, it's taken from uh, epistles or letters of Paul to the different churches. And this one today was to the church at Thessalonica. And it's Thessalonians. We're going to be looking at chapter four, looking at a few verses of scripture there. But the, the theme of First Thessalonians uh, it really kind of encompasses four things. And this is just a little bit of knowledge for you. Number one, it talks about the second coming of Christ. It talks about living a holy life and slash maturity. Uh, we're going to be focusing on that. Uh, it, it talks about encouraging and exhorting one another and also enduring persecution. Um, all those things are things that we can apply to our lives every single day. Uh, the whole focus of this message is don't be satisfied with your current level of spiritual maturity. Keep growing. 
Now, I thought about this. Um, You've probably heard it said before, you know, we give our, our lives to the Lord. We, we, we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And right then and there, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And we can call it quits and think, okay, the job's done. I can now live my life the way I want to live my life. And I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. But the reality is that's not the point, is it? Um, let me ask that one more time, see if I can get some help for a response here. That's not the point, is it? The point isn't just getting you and me to heaven. Because if that were the point, it would happen the moment we said, Jesus, come into my heart. Poof, we're gone. So that's not the point. The point is, we are the body of Christ. The point is, developing into this mature not just a single believer. Yes, individually, we have a responsibility to embrace Christ and walk the walk and let him change us. But we also embrace the body, the collective purpose for why we are still here. That requires maturity for us to live our lives in a way that pleases the Lord to keep growing. Chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse number 1. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. It's not just about rules and regulations. As a matter of fact, it isn't about rules and regulations. Let me be emphatic about that. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. Now, I asked the first service this question. I'm going to ask you the same question. How do we know if we're living in a way or in a manner that pleases God? Just throw out answers. Anybody. How do you know you're living in a way that pleases the Lord? Excuse me? Reading the Word, okay? Reading the Word. You, you're reading the Word, so you know that pleases the Lord. Because what's happening when you're reading the Word? He's speaking to you. He's depositing the seed of His Word in you. Now, I, I picked up one of these, our daily breads. We have these on the counter as you walk in the door. Now, it's funny. Some people will make light of something as small and seemingly as insignificant as this for your growth, your maturity in Christ. But this is seed. This, these things are amazing. They're great fire starters. They, why do you go to a restaurant and add an order and adver, and order an appetizer? Because you are getting your stomach and your body and your nose and your senses all ready for the main course. I think that, that this is where you start. This, something like this can be a tool to get your, your juices flowing for more growth and more maturity. I used to walk around the car lot when I sold cars in Hilo as a 20-something-year-old. Hilo, Hawaii is a 20-something-year-old. And I had a little daily devotional uh, that I used like this. And I literally would walk the morning... And I would be outdoors unlocking cars, because that was part of my job. And I would be unlocking cars. And, and the devotional, the little, the little thing that I have, uh, was basically scripture verses. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't thoughts and things. It was just literally scripture and verse. Scripture and verse. And there would be subjects, you know, healing and prosperity and, and, and uh, forgiveness and different subjects. And then it would have all these verses. And I would walk around in the morning unlocking the cards, and I would be quoting those scriptures. I would be feeding. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And I would be speaking out loud those words. And it was feeding my soul. It was it was kind of giving me the, the warm-up to, I want to spend more time with God, you know, and, and it was really, really good. So yes, we know we're living to please God when we are reading His Word, when we're partaking of Him, because His Word is alive. How else do we know that we are pleasing God with our lives? What, what is happening in our life? We're changing. What, what was that over here? Fruits of the Spirit. Absolutely fruitfulness. 
I gave a bunch of F words this morning in the first service. You missed out. I'll give them to you anyways. Fruitfulness, one of them. You know you're pleasing God when your life is bearing fruit. Here's another F word. Faithfulness. Here's another F word. Functionality or functional. Your life is functional. I, I used an illustration in the first service, and it was a memory that literally popped into my head. Um, you know, as Christians, we can, we can think that we're functional. We're, we're believers. We, we have a relationship with God. We're going through the motions. We sing the songs. We read the word. We're, we're a part of a church, and we think that that is enough, but what does it mean to be functional? It means that you actually, we're actually getting the power to the wheels and the wheels are turning and we're actually moving forward with our life. We're not just spinning our wheels going nowhere. So I, I, I'm on my way from Hilo. Uh, if you're familiar with the Big Island of Hawaii, where, where I lived, Hilo is on the east coast of the Big Island. Kona is on the west coast. And we had moved from Hilo to Kona. And I went, I had my, my Dodge Ram Charger uh, at the dealership in Hilo. And I, my wife and I drove around the island to go pick it up. They'd had it for a couple of weeks and they were doing some work on it. We picked it up and I'm driving around the island. I drive through Waimea. I'm coming down the west coast of, of, of the Kona coast. And as I'm driving, my wife's following me in her car and, and we're going, all of a sudden I hear this boom. And I mean, it, it sh shocked me. I almost lost control of the, of the truck. And I look in my rear view mirror and in my rear view mirror, I see bouncing down the road behind me, aiming for my wife, is my drive shaft. And it's bouncing on the road. And I looked at that and went, oh my, that was my response. That's your response when things like that happen when you're a Christian and you actually fill your heart with, with things of Jesus instead of, Oh, and then whatever. I went, oh my. That can't be good. And all of a sudden, my engine is, you know, it's running, but my car is ending up on the side of the road because the drive shaft that connects the transmission to the rear differential that powers the rear wheels that makes me go forward doesn't connect anymore. So functional is really important. What we're doing here today is great, but if it doesn't translate to a functional life of faith, faithfulness, and fruitfulness, then we're wasting ours and God's time. Amen? We need to be maturing in the things of the Lord because there is a purpose for us being here together. Amen. So, I have a, a quote. I love this quote. How many uh, in here know uh, of the man? Uh, his name is Ray Kroc. Does that ring a bell? I know you know, but you're cheating because you were in the first service. Ray Kroc. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Ray Kroc. Some of you have gone to Ray Kroc's restaurant. McDonald's. Yes. Um, so Ray Kroc had a saying. I love his saying. We're going to put it on the screen for you to see it. It says, when you're green, you're growing. When you're ripe, you rot. So what would be the focus of our purpose to do in life? I would say it would be to remain green in your relationship with God. And, and you know what? What Erica pointed out earlier in, the, in, in this message was the fact that staying in the Word keeps you green. Staying in the Word keeps you growing. And it's so important that we really focus on that. As long as you and I are in the process of learning and growing and developing, then we are green. We stay green. And we are living lives that please God. Now, Thessalonians 
Paul wrote this letter. This is probably one of the most encouraging letters he ever wrote to any of the churches. If you read any of them, you'll see that, that he has some very stern words for some of the churches. Much of them uh, are focused on bringing the church back to where, you know, where the church was planted, and, and then they grow, and then they get off, and all this stuff, and he tries to bring them back. In Thessalonians, it's pretty encouraging. One of the most encouraging, if not the most encouraging letters to the churches, but he still is trying to get them to continue growing. And the four things that he's working on in this letter is he wants the members to continue to love each other. How many of you know how important it is that we keep in love with one another? How often do we see churches get divided because of something that happens and we can't forgive and we stop loving and then the church starts to die. It happens. If you've been going to church for any length of time, you probably have been in a church that ended up at one time or other splitting. I remember going to a church where the, literally the pastor, uh, God bless him, I love Pastor Sloan, but one day somebody brought a rifle to church because he was disgruntled with the pastor's decisions. Not smart. Not Christ-like. It happens. We have to love each other. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians really focused on that. Number two, standing firm in our beliefs. Our beliefs are being challenged daily. What you and I believe that's written in the Bible is challenged daily. What's our response? Do we stop believing what the Word says? Or are we standing firm in our beliefs? Number three, holding up under persecution. How many have ever experienced any kind of persecution for your faith? You may not experience persecution like some other countries experience. I've had pastors literally call me from India and telling me that they had a mob come in on one Sunday service. A mob came in to my friend, Pastor Shant Kumar, came into the church and they set the church on fire and they beat up, they beat up Shant Kumar. They beat up the parishioners and they were, it was a riot and they had to call the police and, and, and it, was, it was wild. We don't know that kind of persecution, but there are things that we do experience that we could call persecution. Um, and then fourthly, God, the gospel was sounding forth from their city. So the encouraging is, to, is make sure that what we're doing here is reaching other people with the gospel. Now, Paul wanted to address some obstacles to the faith of the Thessalonians, and, 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 he, and, he, and he does it in verse 2 to 7. Look at verse 2 with me. For you remember what we taught you, by the authority of the Lord Jesus. God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion, like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Now, let me insert here, God created sex. We know that. It's a good thing. But out of the context that he intended for sex to be a blessing, out of that context, it becomes a curse. It becomes something that the devil uses to divide and conquer us. Paul was addressing it because the church at Thessalonica, that whole area, that whole region, they were really steeped in sexual promiscuity. It, it was just the social norm. It was normal to see things going on in the city. That was, some, that was just part of their cultural uh, MO for the city. And so he has to warn them, they've gotten saved, and they might think that that's normal, and he says, it's not normal. And, and it goes on to say in verse 6, never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife, for the Lord avenges all such sins as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Not only was Paul addressing the potential of individuals falling back into unholy living, he was raising awareness to the threat of the unity of the believers. 
Anything the devil uses to divide and conquer us, any of those threats, we need to, we need to be aware of the devil's devices. If the, if, if the devil's working in your life in, 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 in a certain way, if you allow him to continue to have his way and, and do that, and you just keep showing up at church, those, that, that thing can actually just grow and it can, it can be a problem for the rest of the body. How many have seen lately in the last 60 days, two megachurch pastors in this country have had to step down from their ministries of decades, decades of, of beautiful, fruitful glorious ministry, they've had to step down because of sexual sin that was in the past. And sometimes it's 20 years ago that this happened. Now we as Christians, we can stand up in judgment against people like that, but that's our brother in the Lord, and we are here to help bring accountability, but bring healing and restoration, amen? Sometimes we want to throw the stone. Sometimes we want to say, well, good for him. Good, good that he lost his ministry. Good that he lost his family. Good that he's you know, on the sidelines now. I remember back in the early 80s when I was studying for pastoral ministry, I was told that there were three things to be very wary of. And, and mind you, now I, I'm, I'm setting the setting. It's the 1980s and the preachers that were teaching me back on the big island, they, they, they were, this is what they were saying. Three, three things, and they all start with G. Watch out for girls, watch out for gold, and watch out for glory. Watch out for the sexual temptation that's going to come your way, and whether it's girls or guys, it still starts with a G. Watch out for that. Watch out for the gold, watch out for the, for the, for the, the opportunities to use the ministry as a means to better, better fit and benefit myself financially and the glory. It's easy to feel like, wow, God's really using me. He loves me. I'm special. People are drawn to my personality. They're drawn to my preaching. And you can get full of yourself. And all three of those things can very easily completely disqualify you and make it so God can't use you. And that can infect the church. I saw it many times. Why are we talking about this? Because this is reality. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the drive shaft connects from the transmission to the rear differential and powers the rear wheels. This is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to disconnect the drive shaft so that we don't further our relationship with Jesus and work to, work, to, to, to bring the gospel to the rest of the world. He wants to disconnect that. He doesn't want us to be functional. He wants us to be dysfunctional. It requires us to want to mature in the Lord, to let him deal with us at a personal level and at a corporate level like Paul was with the church at Thessalonica. This is one of those messages where I didn't get real excited about what I was going to preach. Why? Because you're not going to go, woo preach it again, pastor. This is, the, this is kind of like the, this is the doctor giving you a checkup and going, yeah, you need to stop drinking that. You need to stop smoking that. And you need to, and he gives you those, those, you know, things that you need to not do and things that you need to begin doing. Amen, pastor. Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. I love the way that God talks to us. My child, I don't care how old you are. Never lose sight of the dynamic in the relationship that you have with your father. He's, he's our father, and we're his kids. Never stop needing him to give you some wisdom. I already heard that before. Well, listen to it again. My child.
was watching the Olympics and I saw them interviewing this young swimmer, female swimmer. I don't know what her name was. That's not the point, but she was being interviewed and she's 22 years old. She swam in the 2020 Olympics when she was 18. And she was telling the person interviewing her that she had matured and she'd grown so much now that she was 22. And she's not the person she was at 18. Well, I, I hope she's not. But the funny part of it was my wife and I, Tony and I, were sitting there and we're listening. And the way she's talking is like, I've arrived. I know it all. I learned so much since I was a teenager. Don't ever get to the place to where you stop being your father's kid. When you sit down with your devotional, your daily bread, or your word, or you walk outside, and you look up at the sky, and you see the sun rising, never stop going, wow, God, Father, I love you. Thank you. I do it the moment I open the, the shutters in my bedroom window in the morning. Beautiful. That sense of wonder, that childlike joy. My child, never forget the things I've taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Verse 3. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. You know what's interesting? If you want to stand out in the world today, if you want to really shine the light of God's love, all you have to do is be kind, because it's so rare. I have a friend, uh, an elder, I, I, I need you to, to, to picture what he looks like. He's an older gentleman. He, he goes to, I think he goes to a, a Lutheran church here. <clears throat> He's one of my customers at work, excuse me, at work. And uh, he was sharing a story with me. He went to uh, fill up gas at, at a gas station, and he was walking. He went into the, um, uh, into the grocery store part of the gas station, and as he was coming out, there was a, a lady coming in. Now, I... I, I, I'm assessing how I want to tell this story. <clears throat> he's an old white guy. And as he's walking out, and, and please, uh, you understand, I, I'm, what I'm sharing is, is from an absolute place of love. He's an old white guy, but he's, he's, a, he's a military man. He was, in, he was in the Air Force as a colonel for, I want to say it was 30 years so he's got manners, he's from the South, he's, he's been raised right, he's from a different generation, he's, I'm picturing this guy. As he's walking out, a lady, an African-American lady and her husband are walking in. He holds the door open for her. As she's walking in, she goes, I don't need no white guy to hold my door for me. And she yells at him. The husband's behind her and he's like, and he was like, I'm so sorry. And he says, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but my mother raised me that I hold doors for women. And it doesn't matter if you're white or you're black, this is what we do where I was raised. And he was gentle and he just said it like it was. I'm using that as an illustration because we develop attitudes that are very unchristlike. I don't know, maybe she went to church on Sundays, but she didn't let that translate 
to the way she interacted with people. I've been abrupt with people. It's pretty rare, but I've been abrupt with people. I know we all have. All we have to do to shine the light and, and show our maturity is sometimes just to be kind. Because it's so, it's becoming more and more rare. We look for ways to, to divide and, and we've, we've got to just do the opposite. Did that offend anybody for me to say that? That's just, I'm sharing that with you because you could reverse the roles and you could say exactly the same thing. It could have been an old white lady and a, and a black guy. It, it, it's just that we have got to work on growing in Christ, becoming Christ-like. Is our maturing and our walking with the Lord, is it translating to becoming functional in our relationship with God and with others. Verse number five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. What does it mean to trust the Lord with all your heart? What does that mean? Did you know that Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew language did not have a word for the brain, it's always the heart. It's always talking about, so our trust and our feelings, our emotions, everything comes from the heart. When you're reading the word, when, when God is speaking to you, where do you feel it? You feel it in your soul. You feel it within you. God's speaking to you. When the Holy Spirit is trying to, to keep you from harm, keep you from going the wrong direction, where do you feel it? It's in here. Your head's always telling you, no, no, you can do this. You're okay. Everybody else does this. But your heart say no. That's where God, he kind of deals with us. And it's not that pump in your, in your chest that we're talking about. It's the soul. It's the, it's the person on the inside. Verse number six, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Proverbs 3 reminds us to not lean on our own, our own understanding. Why? Why shouldn't we lean on our own understanding? Anybody? Got to listen to God. What is... Where is your understanding come from? It comes from your experiences. It comes from what you've been taught. It comes from what what people impart into you over time, your understanding, and, 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 and mind you, it's, it's good. I mean, we should be learning and growing, but our understanding is limited, isn't it? Have you ever heard about the overview effect, the overview effect? I'll tell you what it is. Have you ever read anything from an astronaut that's gone up into space and then looks back down on Earth and what that experience does? It's real. And it happens to all of them. So much that they literally gave it a term. The overview effect. And there's five things that happen to astronauts that go to space. And these same five things can happen to us when we spend time with God. When we are not leaning on our own understanding. Because when we're on this ground, this terra firmer, when you can see me like this, this close, your understanding of me is one thing. You can see, and we can see the conflicts all around us. We can see the, the division and, and, and the discord in our country. And we can look at the election advertising and we know this world's going to hell. The, the astronauts look from a completely different perspective, just as God does. 
And there's five things they've said that, 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 that comprise this overview effect. Number one, a sense of awe, a sense of wow. I mean, just pull yourself out of the rut that you're in and having one moment with God and seeing things from his perspective will give you a sense of awe, of glory. It's amazing. Secondly, a sense of connection, how things are connected. When I'm flying in a plane, I look down and I love to focus on the little cars that are going. They look like ants. You see the cars on the freeways and the roads. And I don't know what if you do this, but I do this. And I'm looking and I'm thinking to myself, it's like little ants, but you know, in that car right there, there could be a whole family. And God sees, he sees this. I'm looking at this. He knows those people intimately. And, and, and they may seem insignificant to me, but to God, he knows them intimately. And I just look at how everything is connected. I'm looking at the cars and the freeways and the roads and the cities and all that. And I just think about how God sees us. And I, I think that those, those are ways that God wants to open our understanding. A sense of connection. The, another one is a sense of appreciation. When we, when we appreciate things from God's perspective... It gives everything a completely different light and, and, and a sense of self-transcendence, of value and worth, and finally, a sense of unity. I, I, I want to try to work on bringing this to a, to a close, but the point is we've got, we've got to let God give us his thoughts. We, we've got, we can't lean on our own understanding. If we want to mature in, in, in Christ, we have got to grow. Don't be satisfied with your current level of maturity. Keep growing. Purpose to grow in your walk with the Lord. Every day. I I really want to encourage you to um, to carve out time every single day where it's just you and your father, your heavenly father. Realize that he's counting on us to grow in him. He's counting on us to allow him to transform us into his image so that we can be functional, faithful, fruitful, and fulfilled in our walk with him. Amen.